All right, I'm going to get started so we can use the whole session today. So I'm really happy to introduce our speaker for this week's uh, workshop in cultural affairs, King Feng Wang. Uh, professor Wang is a professor at the University of California, Riverside in policy. However, um, Professor Wang is a geographer. So we have a really interesting disciplinary perspective today as we always try to get at our workshops. So with that, I'm just going to hand it over to Professor Wang and she will take it and you can put your questions in the chat, raise your hand, and I will be keeping a, a lookout for those and um, help moderate the discussion. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Joanna. And thanks uh, to the Center for Cultural Affairs for this great opportunity. And thanks, everyone, uh, to be here today. Uh, so I'm going to uh, share the screen first. Um, hope it works. OK. So. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about entrepreneurship in art and the culture industry in the traditionally underserved minority concentrated urban communities, so uh, Newark in New Jersey. Uh, researchers have long uh, argued or documented that art and the culture industries contributed to different aspects of urban development. At the same time, the creative class of thesis has gained global popularity since early 2000. In practice, policymakers and the world, uh, worldwide have intensively invested in art and cultural industries. However, contrary, contrary to the elite profile of creative class, we know that chronically low wages and poverty has been a challenge for many artists. And also, uh, in particular, a large number of racial minorities and women contribute to this particular economic sector. Uh, but there is very limited discussion of race and gender uh, in this aspect. So this study examines the experiences of art entrepreneurs in an urban space that is historically art rich, but with a high concentration of poverty and racial minorities. Specifically, it asks how have art and culture entrepreneurs engaged with and shaped their local communities and what are the factors that enable or constrain art and culture entrepreneurship in traditionally underserved communities. So first, I'm going to briefly talk about the literature relevant to this study. First, the, art labor the artist labor market is dominated by a project-based system of production, and the artists often work as freelancers and independent contractors. So social networking and place-based social relations are particularly important for artists. And beyond the individual level, collaborations among organizations, businesses, artists, and other stakeholders are very important to cultivate ACI development. Overall, the existing studies have emphasized the, the role of community or place-based social networks, the multi-scalar stakeholders and the local and regional art ecosystem. However, despite micro enterprises being a significant proportion of ACIs, there are significantly they are significantly underrepresented in the existing ACI development or entrepreneurship uh, literature. So second uh, strand of literature shows that uh, research has long documented the impacts of the art through individuals direct involvement, audience participation, and the presence of the arts, arts organizations and institutions in the community. In practice, creative cities strategies have uh, emerged in 1980s, and since then have been widely applied in urban planning worldwide. So cities aspiring to become creative cities thus often invest in cultural facilities, art and music scenes and amenities to attract creative talent. However, over the past two decades, researchers have challenged the conceptualization of creativity uh, creative class and creative industries. Some argue that creativity strategies contribute to dispossession through gentrification, increasing social economic inequality, and racialized exclusion. So the third uh, 
uh, standard literature is about, while this study uh, have provided significant insights, they seldom examined ACI from entrepreneurship perspective. So the third strand of literature really talked about entrepreneurship in underserved communities face many challenges, such as barriers to access financial resources, lack of social capital and entrepreneurial role models, stereotyping and discrimination. But at the same time, social capital and potential social entrepreneurship could also bring possible uh, benefits and opportunities in these opportunities. Therefore, understanding the experiences of art and cultural businesses could shed light on how art and cultural entrepreneurship interacts with race, ethnicity, and a place in shaping local communities. So this study was conducted at Newark, New Jersey. Um, this city is well known as a poor center, especially in recent decades, that is plagued by the issues of crime, inequality, political corruption, and many social economic problems. I'm not going through the detail, but the US Census data here indicate that compared to the New Jersey state average, Newark has a higher share of minority population, um, lower educational attainment and income, higher unemployment rate and lower business ownership. And this shows the basic characteristics of the labor force and art business owners at Newark City. Compared to white, the non-white labor force is younger, has lower educational attainment and a higher unemployment rate and earns significantly less. While uh, business ownership is 14% for whites, is only 5% for non whites And the right panel about the art business owners, uh, interestingly different from the overall labor force characteristics, for business owners in ACIs, the non-whites are older and more likely to be female and have a higher educational attainment, but their unemployment rate is still significantly higher. Like here, 70% of them are working as part-time compared with only 42% of whites. They also earn significantly less than their white counterparts. And in this study, uh, I mainly use a qualitative research method. As shown here, data are collected from multiple sources through in-depth interviews, focus group discussion, field observation, and document analysis. And here are the examples of the document data that we collected online, mainly from public media like NPRs, TED Talk, newspaper, business and organizations websites. They include like talk shows, virtual seminars, and virtual uh, focus group discussions. And the findings are based on the translation from this different data sources here shows the main themes under three categories uh, and the relationship uh, between them. Uh, basically, we look at what the community looked like, what the city looked like, and what are the factors fostering creative entrepreneurship and what are the impacts and outcomes. Um, so I'm going to mainly talking about the findings. So the first at the business owner and the business level, the art entrepreneurs in our study described their reasons for starting a business as being strongly motivated by the passion for art and the personal experiences, the opportunity to create products or services, filling the niche market, and entrepreneurship as an avenue to empower themselves and strengthen their communities. The majority of the uh, interviewees indicated that they face challenges because of their color and gender. The challenges come from distrust, stereotyping, uh, difficulty in accessing equity and loans or discrimination. The participants particularly believed that racial inequality resulting in uneven accumulation of wealth is a fundamental systematic barrier to their entrepreneurial uh, achievement. Uh, however, 
These minority business owners are very proud of their social identities and further link their identities to Newark. Beyond the money and the market, the majority of them talk about their business goals with the social responsibilities related to their underrepresentativeness. underrepresentativeness. And here the quote really shows uh, the difficulty, like um, I had the passion to start my own businesses. Uh, I felt there are too many people in my community that didn't have the resources for education or the education to start their businesses. And they also say, I wanted to do as also be able to be an example and a resource for other people who were becoming entrepreneurs, starting their own businesses. Later, we are going to have <clears throat> more examples just like this. Um, the most uh, prevalent and harsh challenge shared among the business owners is the lack of financial support and savings. To cope with the financial difficulties, many business owners work multiple jobs. Their business activities span extensively. Accordingly, the context in which the art businesses operate are increasingly fluid, shaped by both artistic and business goals, turning opportunities resources, partners, location, and the timing. However, working on multiple jobs have significantly limited their capacity to focus on artistic creation and business operation. Some people had to delay their formal investment in business development, including both time and resources. And a third, related to working on multiple jobs and multitasking, almost every entrepreneur commented that being an artist is completely different from being a business owner. Some respondents highlighted a conflict between creativity and commerce, um, expressing concern that economic success was achieved at the expense of their symbolic capital. And a fourth, one of the most re repeated words from business participants is network in one way or another. For minorities and women, however, as shown here, it's difficult to build social relationship and social networks. Let's, like this person say, it's very difficult being an African-American entrepreneur because we don't have economic leverage. You don't own anything and you don't have a network of people who own something. So that means the folks who are owning this multi-level buildings are more influence, have more influence and they are directing their dollars toward the network that they have. Unfortunately, it's quite difficult for me to become part of that, also because I'm not a man. So here we see the intersection between race and gender. So some business owners, um, they often found mentorship and uh, building connection through enrolling in educational programs, such as those offered by Rutgers University. Our findings indeed indicate that institutional support is critical for the businesses survival and growing in underserved communities. Um, also another key factor we see is the businesses, they function also function as gatekeepers in fostering the creative community. So the extended literature has emphasized the importance of gatekeepers in ACIs. However, art organizations located in disadvantaged neighborhood are extremely rare. So the, uh, the businesses we interviewed, we find many of them not only operate as enterprise, but also function as gatekeepers for themselves and other businesses in local communities. Uh, Newark's case suggested that rising from an art company and functioning as an agent for their community comes from both necessity and the creative pursuit of opportunities. Like there's numerous uh, uh, quotes just like this I shown here. They talk about uh, how they grow up as a businesses and how that taught them to be also a working as an agent uh, and advocate for other businesses like they don't have the opportunity to get to discover that's where we come in. Not only do we discover them, we prepare them for the businesses and help them uh, to get, uh, get an opportunity. There are other um, 
And here also says, okay, I, I, I also work in film and television on the music creation side, but I want to be more on the side of music publishing and help others to get their music in projects. Being more of a middle person and, uh, and like a, a, a jewelry design store, on my hand, they sell jewelries. At the same time, they also function like a uh, gallery to showcase other uh, artworks in the communities. So we see many uh, examples just uh, like this. And they uh, also shows strong sense of community because uh, new works abandoned history of art and culture industries provides an important base from which artists, entrepreneurs can thrive. The sense of community and the inner drive to represent and make a positive change in Newark serve as a powerful engine for them uh, to creatively integrate artistic work and business endeavors. Many grew up in the city noticing that people who resemble them were absent in business. Others see their city's socioeconomic landscape as being fraught with injustice and communities that have been fractured. For them, art can act as a platform to, for dismantling injustice and binding the community together. Therefore, art is the formative basis for a community and art entrepreneurs can use it to embody the change that they want to see in their city, like shown by this quote. And they really, the art uh, uh, businesses really work as a catalyst for economic development and urban revitalizations. So we have some numbers talking about the uh, job created and the revenue generated, but we more see lots of social impacts and social entrepreneurship in the local communities, as I'm going to show you uh, next. So here, um, these businesses, they contribute to quality of life, foster civic engagement, beautify and animate neighborhoods, and offer tools for problem solving for people who traditionally lack resources. The Lincoln Park and Riverfront Park are the two examples that have integrated art activities with art, with public health and enver environmental sustainability together. Uh, for example, the Lincoln Park community, they seek to create pathways out of poverty, preserve the area's unique history and foster a return of music and art. This is an old church to be renovated and to be reused when it was on the field work a couple of years ago. They also started community gardens to promote health and the youth education programs at the same time. They are also building affordable housing to make the neighborhood into a, uh, an artist to live and work enclaves. Each year, they organized musical festivals that have involved numerous local small businesses and draw a large number of people outside to attend. And here are the projects organized by the Riverfront Park organizations. It is located in the traditionally immigrant concentrated areas. Uh, certainly, the development of this um, entrepreneurship in art and the culture in the <clears throat> industries in the city requires the collaboration of a multi, multiple stakeholders. They come from multiple sectors, uh, private, public, nonprofit, uh, and universities. So together, they function as a uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. In particular, we find that the higher education in institutions play a significant role. For example, uh, Rutgers University, Newark, it exemplifies this type of higher education institutions. Here is their website of university mission statement. Um, as as it says here, it is not just in Newark, but of Newark, clearly defining itself as an anchor institution. Rutgers University Newark claims promoting and leveraging the art and the culture 
is one of six areas of the university's strategic plan. And in fact, they uh, collaborate with city and the multiple sectors and getting funding from these places as well. Uh, they created this Newark Express. Uh, Newark Express is located in Newark's Haynes uh, building. It is an icon iconic uh, department store in the heart of downtown that has now been completely renovated after having been shuttered for 30 years. Here, uh, this is the inside of the building. There are, uh, this is a 3D uh, painting studio that is open to artists and the local public. They have lots of uh, community-based projects as well inside and outside the building. Um, so uh, at the same time, the center of urban entrepreneurship and economic development at Rutgers University, they have been offering a wide variety of business training programs. And um, for local entrepreneurs, Particularly, it has a artist in residence program directly incubate local artists and art businesses. Um, let me see. Yeah. So uh, now, based on this uh, data and uh, the analysis, I want to uh, just raise a couple of points for discussion. Uh, first, uh, being an artist and the associated social identity provide arts entrepreneurs special motivation and the business goals that differ from the purely profit maximizing entrepreneurs uh, because I, I mainly work on minority entrepreneurs uh, but not particularly in art and the culture industries but in the case of new work just shows a lot of social entrepreneurship activities that are closely related to local community capacity building, especially the sense of community, sense of place, and the social identities impact each other. This further explains the very different economic and social outcomes by their entrepreneurship activities. Whether they were people of color, homosexuals, or immigrants or women looking for equal footing through entrepreneurship and artistic expression, these business owners are transforming the feeling of marginalization into a sense of drive. Through cultural innovation and social entrepreneurship, these business owners are seeking opportunities to foster civic engagement and leverage business endeavors as a prime vehicle for asserting their history and presence as traditionally disadvantaged population within the gentrifying city. But obviously they are facing many constraints. Uh, for example, as the, even, the, as the uneven distribution of wealth across different groups is a significant challenge, the investments are fewer for people of color and women as well. For example, organizations led by people of color, they receive less grant money and are trusted less to make decisions about how to spend those funds than groups with the white leaders. Recent years in New York have seen local art organizations close that were led by people of color and women. We have several cases like this. And another challenge is uh, space. Behind the challenge of space is a deeper concern over ongoing city development and possible gentrification. The reviving urban centers have sparked fears that the revitalization could push out many people. It is further exacerbated by the skyscraping housing market in the neighbor city, New York City. So I, and I participated in some of the discussions originated voluntarily by a group of immigrant art entrepreneurs who were hoping to uh, fight the threat brought by the rapid real estate development. At that time, some of them still worked and lived in local churches and others were in a panic searching for new affordable studio spaces as the old ones would soon be demolished for luxury uh, development. And um, 
yeah, this study is, uh, has uh, many limitations, and especially because it is based on one-time point interviews with a limited number of participants. Um, several questions need, need to be further investi investigated. For example, uh, how this regional uh, cultural entrepreneurship ecosystem really function, and uh, also what are the impacts of creative entrepreneurship on the communities that are beyond uh, economic beyond the job creation and the revenue generated. There are uh, uh, more research definitely need to be done. Uh, to move forward, I really think a social impact approach that uh, emphasizes the importance of local organ organically formed cultural production and a robust art ecosystem um, Rather than advancing the art as only an economic driver, it needs a lot of uh, attention, especially in underserved communities. Uh, we have so many economic development, development policies targeting these communities, but they haven't um, achieved the expectation. But how to combine, for example, the art and the cultural entrepreneurship, uh, social entrepreneurship, and economic development to really build the community, I think is a, uh, worth more research and it would be significantly uh, for practice and policy making as well. And this study also calls to investigate the role played by different nonprofit organizations and institutions, especially I think a network approach would be very interesting to look at the role of individual uh, stakeholders and the interconnection among them. At the same time, more mixed research methods are really needed to combine different sources of data to, for example, to examine the impacts at the neighborhood level, at the uh, community level, and the different aspects of the impact. It calls for uh, lot of uh, research. To be very honest, this study, we finally did this uh, qualitative research, not only because uh, qualitative provide lots of in-depth knowledge on the process behind the entrepreneurship process, but also uh, a, a big difficulty we're facing is we really uh, do not have uh, much data in this area. So uh, I'm done uh, for this uh, presentation. I would uh, look Thank forward you. to yeah to more. Thank you so much, King Feng. So really wonderful. Um, I'm going to start with the first question, and then if anyone else has questions, please go ahead and either raise your hand or put it into the chat um, or just unmute yourself. But I'm in, I'm particularly interested in this demarcation between entrepreneurs, cultural entrepreneurs, um, you know, entrepreneurship versus cultural entrepreneurship, because I think a lot of what we see in the cultural entrepreneurship field is honestly kind of a confounding of those two things. We sort of necessarily assume that the same things we're seeing in the trends in entrepreneurship are also happening in cultural entrepreneurship and vice versa. So I'm always really interested sort of to understand how the two things compare. So I'm wondering, because this is not your only area of research, you do work in entrepreneurship more generally, and you also do work um, looking at underserved communities in entrepreneurship more generally, how does this, um, how do these findings that you were reporting on here about cultural entrepreneurship region compare to what you see in terms of trends in the general entrepreneurship um, literature, especially among underserved communities? I mean, are, are, the, the, are you seeing the same types of challenges? The t would you recommend the same type of approach Oppose, you know, focusing on social impact as opposed to economic impact. I really wonder kind of this compare and contrast and my, how might you comment on that? Um, that's a great question. Uh, because like during COVID, we uh, interviewed businesses, we serviced on the businesses in uh, Southern California, where I am. We are inland Southern California, where mainly Hispanic population concentrated area. 
we really, uh, we, we just uh, uh, collect data from all the businesses in terms of the impacts of COVID and how they cope with the COVID. Uh, we, we really find it interestingly, um, the businesses in art and culture industries, by the way, we have a very limited number of art and culture industries in this region. We do not have an art ecosystem uh, in this region like in Newark. We don't have that at all. So our number of art industries is very limited, but they obviously show lots of optimistic thinking. And also because they are more, uh, uh, they are more using technology, I would say that way. Uh, so they, 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 they deal with, they cope with the challenges uh, more rapidly. And also because of they use technology, they reach different communities virtually, which is much beyond the local community, actually. This gave them a lot of advantage uh, in terms of coping with uh, the challenges. Also, when they talk about a lot of this community outreach, community connections, I am not doing a systematic comparison, but based on uh, different case studies, I think in terms of the impacts, I would see more social entrepreneurship activities among art and the culture industries. And also uh, for minority and immigrant owned enterprises, we normally have two uh, perspectives in terms of how they started their own businesses, okay? So for immigrant minority businesses in general, we have two. One is we call survivalist perspective because you don't have other labor market opportunities. You have to turn to self-employment. This is a, a disadvantaged perspective. But another is opportunity perspective. Mainly, you see the opportunity, you jump onto the opportunity, you, you, you create your businesses in that way. Uh, there are lots of challenges facing small uh, businesses, minority businesses in general, but for art businesses, we saw, we heard a lot of like the passion, the passion for art. It's more like a natural transition to a owning my own businesses because they most cases started as freelancers. And then they talk about opportunities, although they talk about challenges there, uh, but they also talk about the passion and opportunity. In my view, they are more about uh, the other side of the perspective, which is opportunity perspective. They, they seek the opportunity, they, they develop that naturally. And you know, by saying this, I see the challenges, some fundamental challenges, they are uh, general for most businesses, uh, including non uh, including uh, even white small businesses. We all talked about like financial. Financial is the thing, everybody talks about that. And then for women and minority, they face more challenges. Everybody talks about, almost everyone talk about uh, the like stereotyping especially women of color, either in art or non-art. People all talked about that. Um, but I would say, again, the art industry, so they emphasize a lot of um, identity. And identity being a minority, identity of being an artist, identity of my community, they emphasize that a lot. So in my, in my thinking, I think this identity thing with your identity of community that really uh, incubate and promote the creation of social entrepreneurship. That's why uh, they, they, they do more in that area. But this definitely uh, need a more uh, systematic uh, compar com comparison. And uh, I would say probably the bigger difficulty just lies in, we do not have much data. Uh, although I see other potential, like we do experimental type of research, but I still think on the ground, what people are thinking, how people are doing, how they deal with those things day by day is, 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 is very important to know. Yeah. Such a great answer, because I think a lot of this does have to do with data limitation 
and also also methods of study, which you mentioned at the end of your presentation, because, you know, I think most of my work in this area focuses on how artists are actually pretty similar to other workers. So, and then also in that respect, how artists entrepreneurs are pretty similar. So you mentioned, for example, the survivalist perspective. So if you look at large scale quant data, then you see the same kind of um, a trend, which is during times of recession, self-employed artists turn, sorry, artists are more likely to turn to self-employment, right? Because it's this sort of safe haven for them. But what you're seeing on the ground, talking to the people who are owning these businesses and running them is that it's, it's this, um, it, it's this passion for what they're doing that's sort of motivating them and leading them in their business choices. I do think a lot of it has to do with the types of 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 people you're 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 picking up on in the quantitative data versus the ethnographic the interview approach, which you're probably speaking to a, a different sort of sample of individuals. So I don't want to go on because I don't want to take over. As yeah. you can see, I'm I'm very oh go ahead yeah. I just want to add on uh, because you talked about the quantitative data. The bigger thing is. Um, even the ACIs were, 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 were census. Their big mm -hmm. thing is art, artists, art uh, business owners, many of them, they are, they are holding multiple jobs. Almost everyone we interview, they hold multiple jobs because they say, I need, to, I need to make a living and then to support my passion. So, so this gave them the flexibility, gave them this natural transition but from an uh, entrepreneurship perspective, um, it's also delayed, also distract them, also generate more difficulties. Uh, this is a, something very different from general minority businesses. And uh, in this sense, probably the sense of data is not, uh, I wouldn't say accurate in a way. It probably means a large number of real artists, entrepreneurs in this way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, excellent point. Such an important one to keep in mind. So I want to get to these questions and I'm just going to start with um, Carol first because it's sort of an, ad, uh, an addendum to what we're talking about. And then I'll go to Bronwyn and Michael. But uh, Carol asks about the whether the interviews touched on whether people were deciding on for-profit or non-profit sector as forms for their enterprise. So any kind of decision-making in, in terms of uh, business form? This is a great question uh, because um, we find that majority of the businesses uh, we are we are talking to. By the way, I have to uh, I must just say my data is skewed, biased in this way because I reach out, I, I access them through uh, Rutgers University. They have a business incubating programs. I reach the businesses through them. So you can imagine majority of them they are either established, they were already known, they go to the uh, programs, or they are very, very young at the very beginning. So it is a bias in this way. I cannot claim they are representing majority of them. No, no, there's no representation. But they keep talking about the common themes. We also see the common themes from the existing literature. So we try, we try to triangulate the different perspectives from different sectors. Then the majority of the businesses we're talking to, we find that they have their for profit business. Then at the same time, they set up a nonprofit organization. Almost majority of them have that way. So they told me with this nonprofit, they can do a lot of community work. They can also go for, sometimes go for the grant as well. So in this way, uh, to answer Carol, your question, uh, we often see this a sister sisterhood for the same business owner. They have this business, but they also have this uh, uh, nonprofit. Some of them they have several businesses, for profits, but they also have a multiple uh, uh, nonprofits, uh, hand by hand together. This is how they practice. So this could be how they can function as a gatekeeper as well. Yeah, I don't know how uh, I need. I don't know how they really set up this, but this is how they practice, yeah. 
Yeah, such a great insight there. I agree with Carol. I did miss David's question in the beginning, so let me get back to that. He's interested in the world's central kitchen, which practices empowerment philanthropy and asset-based social change. And they keep on, they, so WCK keeps purchasing power and production within communities of color. Are there potential analogies to cultural entrepreneurship? I think this is a very, very uh, important question in terms of, yes, we have been talking about years and years about the challenges facing them, but how to really solve this problem? What are the solution? Yes, there's no easy answer to that solution, but we see lots of nonprofits or even university, um, like here we talk about the uh, WCK, there are many programs and incubators or different efforts. They are just uh, putting efforts together to focus on minority uh, owned enterprises and in underserved communities. For example, at Rutgers University, their Center for Urban Entrepreneurship and uh, Urban Development. So they mainly focus on underserved communities. They recruit their uh, program participants, not mainly from students. Yes, yeah, some of them, they're students, but the majority of them, they are uh, people from the Newark city. They are the local small businesses or the local people who, who want to start their businesses. They are first the generation business owner. Uh, they also start an ETI program. Just to mainly focus on this very small uh, individual and even not a business yet person. So uh, they are mainly focused on uh, training, business planning, business management. Uh, I would say existing challenge about, it, we talk about 3M, management knowledge, money, and the market. So most universities, they focus on management knowledge, but the money on the market, in most cases, university cannot do that. We're just uh, running a network analysis, looking at UNC uh, Chapel Hill, look at their network to fostering small business. We find, oh, they're so strong in expert knowledge, in training, but they are very, very weak in money and the market. But we also know nationally, I know there's a, a program called Ascend. Uh, it probably uh, running, you, you want to check that out as well, called Ascend. It is organized by UW Seattle. Uh, they actually link many, several uh, universities and uh, local organizations in 13 cities across the country. So they mainly focused on uh, inner city, or uh, minority owned businesses. They not only focus on the training program, management knowledge part, but also work with like uh, JP Morgan with the local funding uh, or VC capital, uh, sorry, VC, uh, venture capital. They work with a uh, money part as well. They also work with the local bigger corporations in order to get more contracts. So they are building this 3M model. Uh, I think that this WC kitchen uh, probably can, you know, it is part of that kind of efforts to really work on the ground to solve the problem, to provide more resources and create a market, um, link the underserved communities to the outside. That's always my another argument. We, 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 we emphasize a lot of this social capital within the community, but they really need to diversify that cap the social capital to bring more market and information and money into that neighborhood, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so getting to Bronwyn's question, she wonders what a participatory action research project might look like in this area and how it could support the kinds of entrepreneurs you've studied. Uh, this is a, a participatory action research project, I would just say especially for underserved communities, especially if you focus on social impacts, uh, it's very necessary. For me, uh, as a researcher, I work here in uh, California, and then I go to Newark 
I do feel the work, but just uh, you know, two weeks at the most. And then what we access the local uh, entrepreneurs, in many cases, they ask me, hi, Dr. Wong, can you link me to who? Can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? Uh, being a researcher, we were warned. At the very beginning, you have to make it very clear. You don't want to give them misleading hopes about what you as a researcher can do. But I'm just wondering, you know, if I'm a part of Rutgers University, I'm a part of this uh, artist in residence program. I could possibly just uh, work as this participatory type of research, you know, to really uh, light the participants to guide the research. And I think there are more in-depth um, knowledge, but more about the practice changes that are going to happen within the community. I think that's going to be very, very beneficial to the community. Yes, um, I think the key would be the connection between the researcher and the practitioner and the ground uh, local community. If their, their, their opportunity to facilitate the connection happening, that would be tremendously significant for underserved communities. Right. So Michael had a question. He would be interested in knowing if these cultural entrepreneurs in Newark bended to a greater or lesser extent from general economic development initiatives such as SBA programs compared to all entrepreneurs across other BEA economic sectors. Um, this is a very good question. I don't have a direct data. Uh, however, uh, in general, the, the, the small, uh, the SBA program, when they fit, when they are eligible, then everybody is just uh, eligible. I would think uh, it's more about um, people-based. Unlike people here is a business-based. Once you're eligible, then you are eligible. But obviously at the local level, uh, there are a lot of like the money, the, the like PPP loans or some when COVID happens or other SBA programs, when the federal money go to the state and the city level, then the city has a lot of uh, uh, freedom and room in terms of how to use it. Like at Newark, it's very interesting. Uh, their mayor is a uh, writer. And, uh, and they have the Department of uh, Culture, who is a musician. Their uh, Lincoln Park uh, director is a musician. And uh, another park director is a, like, a talk show host. Uh, there are performance artists. There are artists all over the place. I say all over the place means they really have a lot of power in decision making, in my view. So they are at the different department. And they, when COVID comes, the mayor just uh, has more money. They direct it to certain neighborhood. So there are, how many um, university entrepreneurship centers? We have so many university uh, centers, but how many of them, they are really direct to the underserved communities? And how many of them, they are really particularly uh, incubating, they call hub, a, a business hub, mainly on art and the culture industry, not many, but New York has all of this. So when the money operated at the local level, the art and, uh, art and culture entrepreneurs, they do have lots of um, opportunities to apply for the grants, but they face the big challenge is uh, they need to write grants, writing proposal is a huge challenge for almost all these small businesses. So many of them just uh, skip them. Um, so in terms of building, building the, the infrastructure, it is really a, 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 a long way to go to help them. Yeah, uh, at the local level, for New York uh, case, I would say, yes, we have money. But if you ask uh, here, Riverside, California, no, we don't. We even don't have an umbrella art uh, council or art organizations, we don't have that. But New York has, they have the overarching overarching uh, our council that benefit us. I would think this is a more about a place um, oriented or place-based uh, really 
depends on individual city, individual decision makers in terms of how to develop which certain industries. In this way, art and the culture industry really play into the broader city's economic development. Then it benefits from there. Um, otherwise, it's hard to for art and uh, culture industries really benefit too much. Actually, uh, most practitioners I talk to, they have to really uh, make themselves as an economic driver in order to get the resources, in order to get the money. Yeah. Yeah, I would imagine too, it has also something to do with whether these businesses are incorporated. I, did you interview only incorporated businesses or some were some non-incorporated? Majority of them, they are not incorporated. Yeah, huge difference. So Kelsey's question, and then Carol has her hand up. So Kelsey, how do you, how if at all do you think the presence of established arts and cultural organizations, theaters, museums, symphonies, um, in any given area may be related uh, to cultural entrepreneurial activity? So these larger organizations, typically nonprofits, are there more opportunities, more obstacles, or are they even together or aware of each other? So is there any kind of um, communication or collaboration between large established cultural nonprofits and this cultural entrepreneurship ecosystem that you've been looking at? Um, if you look at the literature, like by Marcuson or her colleagues, and also uh, recent research, uh, they talk about a clear correlation between art organization and entrepreneurship. You can see that clearly. Uh, however, I'm thinking, especially for the underserved communities, many of them, they really start as a freelancer. Uh, if the, 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 the large established art organizations like theaters, museums, symphonies, they mainly serve the mainstream upper scale or large large scale businesses were who are already known. They're, in New York case, they have their uh, theater, really they try to uh, bring their local artists to come in. But I think it's special case. They also have a museum. When we ask them, you know, what are the nonprofit organizations who have been closely working with? They mainly work with some smaller, various, lots of this local anchor, small scale, uh, uh, minority owned or women owned. They mention many of them. But when they talk about museum, a lot of them really say, I really don't have much relationship with them. Uh, my case with New York is, I think, is not the established art and culture organization play a role in generating more businesses or entrepreneurship activities or either or even incubating them. It's more about non very non-chained, very localized, uh, uh, smaller, they are working with uh, small businesses. And in this sense, uh, Newark University, they have the, the building, they renovated the building, they open so many smaller spaces. They are working with the local I, lo, local level. So I guess my point is, in practice, it is not a much connection I see. I didn't see much connection, but it is so necessary for the bigger player to play into this field because they have more resources, they have more power. They are easily to bring people in. Um, I think uh, this may be contradictory, but I think this is a reality and a need, probably that that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. Carol, did I see your hand up? It went away. Oh, I, just because I it's my turn, right? Yeah. So I went ahead <laughs> and put it down. So pardon me for keeping my screen blank because I am not camera ready today. Um, thank you for just an incredibly fascinating um, presentation and interesting work. I wanted to ask about some of the ways that you might have disaggregated the data um, in terms of the demographics of the people who you're talking about. Um, 
I see Murray is on the call and Murray, myself and Neville Vicaria just finished some work that's kind of similar to what you're doing, but in the nonprofit sector. And one of the things that we found, uh, this really is Murray's work, I'm like stealing her thunder, <laughs> but is that um, among different populations, there are very different um, financial, so the different populations have very different financial situations. Uh, if you look broadly at uh, them in the nonprofit arts and culture. So for example, South Asian populations seem to have pretty strong entities. Um, some members of um, African immigrant communities have very strong financials in terms of for their organizations. So when we look just at a really high like aggregated level, it makes sense to talk about people of color versus white people and all of the um, inequities that are uh, involved in that. But then also there are inequities within these demographic categories. And I wonder if you looked at that at all or if you have a sense of how relevant or important that might be to your findings. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Carol, for this question. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think uh, non-wise itself is too much, too general category. Absolutely. Each uh, racial or ethnic groups have very different profile and different opportunity structures. I would say even their industrial or type of business concentration is very different. Yeah, they, they are performing different type of arts. Yeah, I think this is a uh, this is a also related with the social social capital within their ethnic uh, community. For example, if uh, if if you have like in New York cases, they have lots of people working in uh, music and filming industries. Uh, they talk about how they connected to uh, to to someone who brought this person into the industry. They talk about how they work within the community, within African-American uh, community, uh, the role model, the, the people, the resources that they know. So all this is social capital, financial capital, and mentorship resources, they all lead them towards to certain industries. Even in general, ethnic labor market concentration or segmentation or segregation, however you call them, this is social capital play a significant role in their industrial concentration. So absolutely, uh, each this ethnic uh, 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 resources, identity, community that closely work with the resources, the information that are going to impact what kind of art they are performing, and uh, what kind of businesses businesses they are doing, and also their uh, socioeconomic characteristics are very different. Uh, the big difficulty for me as a researcher is um, even lump them together. It's still very difficult to reach them. Not to mention, okay, today I do like African versus, uh, uh, versus Latino versus, like when I'm in Riverside, Southern California, next step, if I work, I probably have more opportunity to work with Latino population, but, uh, but maybe not for other researchers. So down the road, it would be very, very critical for researchers to work with the practitioners and work with the people like you and we really go into this community to work together, get more data, understand this process behind that. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much for that answer. And I really would encourage you to um, take a look at the report that's gonna come out from the Alliance for California Traditional Arts, which is what we did our research for, which will be particularly relevant to you, I hope, because you're there in California. So they're talking about traditional folk arts and arts in underserved communities and ethnic communities um, around the country. But of course that organization is in California. Sure, so thank, thank you, Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. Yes, I will, I will contact you as well, okay, yeah. Great, well, thank you, Carol. I, I noticed on the clock we're a little past one, so we should bring this to a close with a big appreciation to King Fong. This was a really thank interesting you. conversation. I think we've proved that we could keep going and having this conversation for many hours. So thank you very much for bringing this to us. I loved it, very rich stuff. Thank you all for attending and for the great questions. 
We'll be back in two weeks. I think it's Mariah Kim will be our speaker in two weeks time, if I've got that right. So we're excited about that. It's going to continue. So thank you all for being part of the CCA's workshop series, and I'll see you in a fortnight.